Hello. Hi, everybody. I think we are live on Facebook. Um, I am Molly. I'm the nutritional therapy practitioner over at parsleyandpumpkins.com, and I'm joined today by Colleen Holland, and we're going to be talking about the importance of regular ovulation. So um, this is the first interview in a series of the Modern Women's Health Summit, where we're going to be talking to a whole bunch of experts all about women's health issues, particularly in the context of this crazy modern life that we are all trying to be healthy while living in, which can sometimes really be fighting against um, us, you know, achieving our health goals. So um, let's go ahead and dive in. If you are joining us live, please comment on the video. I will have um, it up on my phone so that we can take a look and see um, everyone's comments. If you have any questions during the broadcast, please type them into the comments. We will try to cover as many of those as we can um, during our interview. So I have with me Dr. Colleen Holland. She has been practicing in women's health for over 17 years, which is absolutely amazing. Her focus is in functional medicine and perinatal care led her to the world of fertility awareness and holistic reproductive care. So Colleen's practice, Womb for Growth, W-O-M-B, which is the cutest name I've ever heard for a fertility practice, specializes in functional reproductive health care, helping women with everything from painful periods to fertility challenges. And I have had the pleasure of working with Colleen on my own charts. She's teaching me how to chart my cycles and helping me get some information from that, and I can vouch for her just her amazing warm spirit and heart and her just profound knowledge in this area. So I'm really excited to get to talk to you, Colleen, and to share all this information with everyone watching. Thanks, Molly. <laughs> so uh, do you want to give us a little background on yourself, kind of what got you into working with women? I know you mentioned in your intro you used to be in perinatal care. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I... Right out of chiropractic school, I knew that I wanted to focus on women who are in their fertile years. I love working with pregnant women and working with their babies and adjusting them. Working with that population, I began to see some real challenges um, with their health, in particular with their fertility. And so I just started taking more of my functional medicine, therapy, but also really even postpartum. I saw a lot of clients postpartum. And I saw a lot of challenges for moms at that time in their life. Uh, very common for women to kind of tank after they give birth for their thyroids to suffer and for other issues like even latch issues with their babies and colic. And um, you name it, oh, so much was going on. And I could see women, you know, it's hard enough to be a woman in this world to add motherhood on top of that and career and then to have to deal with so many health concerns that they were routinely being told, oh, it's just a part of this part of your life. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what happens to women. Here you can go on the pill or we can give you an antidepressant or we can give you this or give you that. Um, but nobody was really working with women to get to the root cause of what was going on with them. And so I started to just kind of draw some, draw the lines between the dots really and kind of figure out what the picture was. And for so many of those women, it had to do with uh, something that happened years before even the thought of pregnancy occurred, and that is that they had some, some significant hormonal imbalance. Um, part of that is lifestyle. Part of that is diet. A lot of that is, unfortunately, um, a lot of misleading information that we're taught about our own menstrual cycles and what the pill does for those menstrual cycles. And so... I uh, began to realize that this was, you know, a huge area where women's health was really at a loss. Um, many of my clients, I would refer them to their ob and literally the three most common uh, things that they would be offered would be either synthetic hormones, um, antidepressants, or surgery if they were done having children. And I thought, you know, there's, there's more to this. There's, more, there's got to be more out there. And so I just started looking to see what else could women rely on to help bring them balance and to improve their lives ultimately and their, um, their families' lives as well. And so that's how I learned uh, or kind of got into womb care 
Uh, I studied Arvigo therapy and became a practitioner in that and added that to my practice. Obviously, nutrition is a foundational part. Mm -hmm. um, and really just, you know, the functional medicine, looking at hormones, the hormone panels, and then trying to figure out how we can balance the hormones rather than just try to add more hormones in. Uh, and there are many reasons why the uh, former would be more uh, beneficial than the latter there. Yeah, yeah. So, so you yeah. really got to see women in all stages of this from, you know, mm -hmm. before they got pregnant, during, and after. So you probably yeah. got to see a few women with, you know, their health, like you said, getting a little bit worse, and then you tank right afterwards. That's a really cool perspective uh, to be able to have. It's it's uh, it's been a gift to actually be able to just sort of look back over my career and see that literally working with hundreds of women who have had some form of challenge and difficulty. Um, yeah, and I know we're going to get into some of the meat of that in a bit, but yeah, I'm I'm very grateful for this path that I've gone down. You know, there I don't have many colleagues who specialize in this area of health. And um, I truly feel like I have been called to this area of health. I've had my own issues with hormone balance and women's health issues. And each thing that I've learned, I bring to my practice. And so much of it is, is really just about educating women so that mm -hmm. they know the truth about how their bodies work and um, also know fully informed, uh, have fully informed consent about what they utilize to be able to help bring their body into into balance again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so many people in this field do get into it because we've had challenges of our own. And like you mentioned earlier, usually the only solutions offered are hormones, the birth control, antidepressants, or surgery. Mm -hmm. um, surgery is, is offered probably a little bit more than it needs to for some of these hormone imbalances. Um, sure. There's a so, time and a place for all of those options, but yeah. really there's so much more we could be doing to avoid those more drastic options. Yeah, and like you said, being fully aware of what all of the options are so that at least you feel like you have a choice in what's happening to you, that you have had some education, you know what your options are, and you can make the choice that is, is best for you. I think a lot of women are, are even deprived that option of knowing what all of the options are and having the ability to choose. Mm -hmm. So for some people watching who maybe, you know, have not uh, heard about their hormones since sex ed back in, you know, what, sixth grade when we had like a 30-minute workshop, do you want to give us a little rundown, just a, a mini kind of um, refresher on the hormones we're going to be talking about today, where they fit in our cycle and kind of their relationship to each other? Mm -hmm. Sure. So most most of us are familiar with the two main hormones that women uh, have throughout their cycle, estrogen and progesterone. And we have a few other hormones, too. We also have testosterone, and we also have uh, other hormones like luteinizing hormone, and we have cortisol, and all of this plays a role in our endocrine balance or our cycle balance. But we'll talk about estrogen and progesterone since those are the main players. And estrogen is a, I'll probably repeat this a couple of times, but estrogen is a growth hormone. And so that's an important concept to get across. Uh, that's the hormone that is more prevalent in the beginning of our cycle. So once our period starts to calm down and, and finish, estrogen increases pretty dramatically until we hit ovulation. And that increase in estrogen is what helps to mature and grow the egg that we'll release for ovulation. It also helps to mature and grow the endometrial lining, really more proliferate the endo endometrial lining. Uh, and then it also has an effect on the cells of our cervix to help them to produce the cervical mucus that I'm sure we'll talk about at some point. Uh, but that's all part of fertility for us. And so estrogen works on the receptors to help to grow and proliferate. And we need a balance between estrogen and progesterone. Um, if we have all growth and prol proliferation, that can lead us uh, into, you know, uh, overgrowth and even out-of-control growth, things like cancer, um, and we don't want that. So beautifully, nature balances it out, and once we ovulate, we actually create within our ovary where the egg has been released, it becomes a temporary endocrine organ or endocrine gland, really. And it so starts cool. To, it's so cool, yeah, and it's, it's remarkable because so much has to happen 
in that tiny little gland for the next two weeks before our next period or for the next several months while we're pregnant. Um, but yeah, the, the little endocrine gland makes a ton of progesterone, even more progesterone than uh, like level wise than we make of estrogen. And so that goes to show you just how important the hormone progesterone is. So it balances out the estrogen. It stops the proliferation of, of the tissues that estrogen has sort of set in, in motion. And what it does is then it matures that those tissues that the estrogen has proliferated. So it kind of keeps the estrogen in check. And it's really necessary to be able to do that. Um, and then, you know, right before our period starts, if, if we do not conceive and our body is not getting the signal from a, a tiny embryo, then the corpus luteum, which is the little endocrine gland, the temporary endocrine gland in the ovary that is making the progesterone, if it's not getting a signal from a tiny little embryo, then it will know the cycle is over, it's going to close up shop, shut down, and then a new cycle will begin. So progesterone production stops fairly abruptly, and then uh, we'll see uh, re a reflection of that. If you're taking your temperatures every morning, your basal body temperatures, you're going to see your temperature drop, and that's a direct reflection of that of that progesterone dropping because progesterone is a like an incubator hormone, progestational. And so if we don't need that anymore, there's no little one to grow, then a new cycle will start. And then we start up again with estrogen and, and so on. So it's this cool. amazing cycle of checks and balances, yin and yang. Yeah, it, it is very cool. Yeah. So what really stood out, and I think that a lot of people don't realize, is that you only produce progesterone if you ovulate. That's the mm -hmm. only part in your cycle where you would ever even produce this hormone. Is that right? Right. There, there is a little bit of progesterone production from our adrenals, but it pales in comparison to what we produce within our ovaries. And what sure. we produce within our ovaries is really what we need. We need a lot of progesterone. Yeah. So without ovulation, we don't have that temporary endocrine gland, the corpus luteum, to produce the progesterone. So if we are not ovulatory, we're not making very much progesterone. And that can create a number of issues, um, you know, worst case scenarios to, um, you know, PMS and uh, symptoms. Most PMS symptoms are actually symptoms of low progesterone, including spotting, uh, uh, breast tenderness, mood irritability, anxiety, insomnia, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Since we're on that topic, um, do you want to explain a little bit for people about um, the levels of progesterone as they relate to estrogen. I'm sure that some people listening have Googled what's going on for them and at some point have seen the phrase estrogen dominance. Um, sure. That sounds like it would be a good fit right here. Yeah, so estrogen dominance, so at various points in the cycle, it will really depend on what day in your cycle you are to talk about specific um, quantities of each hormone. But in general, the first half of our cycle is dominated by estrogen. Very little progesterone is being made, and that's fine. And then after ovulation, we obviously have that big uptake in uh, our uptick in progesterone production. And so when we test for progesterone to see if someone has a sufficient level, we always want to test around seven days, seven to nine days after ovulation. And the thing is that we don't often unless we're charting our cycles, we don't know when that seven to nine days after ovulation is because many of us are not even aware of when we're ovulating. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, um, most providers will assume that women should be on a 28-day cycle. And so they will tell you to get a 21-day progesterone test. Yeah, which how and, many women have you met that have a perfect 28-day cycle? Very few. <laughs> and it's perfectly healthy to have a 32-day cycle or a 26-day cycle. And so when people tell me, oh, you know, I have all these symptoms, and their symptoms are screaming um, some estrogen dominance, some low progesterone, but my doctor did tests and all my hormones are fine. And I think, no, it, your symptoms are telling you that you have hormone imbalance. And so it's likely that the test was 
just done at the wrong time, or you know, symptoms trump any blood tests or urine tests or saliva tests, in my opinion, and I've done all of them over the years. So symptoms are always the most important to consider, and uh, we that's one of the reasons why I love teaching women to chart their cycles, because we can actually utilize their cycle charts diagnostically, and that can be so valuable, and it's a mm -hmm. lot less expensive and invasive than getting blood tests or urine tests or saliva tests. Yeah, so much less expensive. And what I've seen in blood tests is that sometimes the, re the reference range of what is normal is not necessarily the optimal range, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a trend towards something going on. I think a lot of women think, you know, if they fall within the normal range, then everything is fine and it's done. Yeah, and then it gives you just, you know, Traditional labs give you a moment in time, whereas mm -hmm. your chart will give you your entire cycle and a, you know a what's going on throughout the cycle, which is so much more valuable. Yeah. And your original question about estrogen dominance, so we, we call it estrogen dominance. We can also call it, um, which is probably a little more accurate, call it a situation of unopposed estrogen. Because, I love that term. Yeah. Uh, going back to that yin and yang uh, between estrogen and progesterone, we need a balance, and so if there's more estrogen and less progesterone, you're going to have unopposed estrogen or estrogen dominance. Um, there are situations where there's not necessarily an excess of estrogen, but there's such a lack of progesterone that you have relatively uh, an estrogen dominant situation. So yeah, unopposed estrogen, and it's very common uh, for a number of reasons for women to have estrogen dominance, one of which is because many of us don't realize we're not ovulating regularly. And that's the big one. Um, the other is that uh, the hormonal contraceptives actually keep us from ovulating, which is, unfortunately, most women are not aware of that fact. And they're told often that uh, the pill will regulate their periods or regulate their cycles. Um, and we can go into that at any point. Um, and also we have a lot of environmental factors that increase the estrogen level in our bodies. And a term that many people have heard of called xenoestrogens. Mm -hmm. Things um, like from plastics can affect our body and attach to our estrogen receptors and provide some estrogen uh, stimulation that's above and beyond what our body needs and wants. So yeah. it's very yeah. common for women to have a situation of unopposed estrogen and the and stress as well you know we can talk about some of the things that help improve progesterone levels um stress is not one of them and so nope. <laughs> the world we live in is uh, always putting us into a state of unopposed estrogen and unless we're really vigilant about it and we you know we we do we make some changes um uh, that that affects a majority of women so in your experience with teaching women um, charting, are there any like really common misconceptions that you see when women come into this brand new that you think need to be dispelled? Like if we could put a billboard up somewhere, what, what myths would you like to dispel about <laughs> uh, So most, uh, most of us are taught to believe that if we bleed regularly, every 30 days-ish, give or take, that we are ovulating. And that is a myth. Uh, most of us don't know that that can be a myth until we start charting, and especially if we're using our basal body temperature, which is the uh, one biomarker of fertility that can absolutely uh, let us know when and, um, and for sure that we have ovulated. And so basal body temperature is very helpful to determine exactly when we've ovulated and if we are. Also paying attention to mucus. And it can be a clear indication. Um, other symptoms, too, like middle schmerz, uh, like sometimes women will experience a little bit of discomfort or crampiness right around ovulation for a few hours or a day. Uh, so we look at all sorts of biomarkers of fertility to help us determine if you are indeed ovulating. I know that there's been some research. Actually, one of uh, this, uh, Dr. Jerry Lynn Pryor at the Center for Menstrual Cycle and Ovulatory Research in Canada Great, great resource. She's done really the only, the only research on women's menstrual health and ovulation, uh, and she's published some great studies that look at a group of women who 
they were chosen for having regular cycles, being normal BMI, um, otherwise all other variables healthy. And she found that up to 30% of the women that they had in the study missed ovulation within the year of the study at some point. Oh. And so even despite thinking that they had regular periods and everything else was normal, either um, so sh to, to clarify, up to 30% of the women had not ovulated by day 15, and these were women who had, like, regular 28, 29-day cycles, okay. or they had ovulated after that point, which would have made uh, for a short luteal phase and low progesterone. So without ever looking into this, we would not assume that those women would have any difficulty with ovulation or creating enough progesterone after ovulating. So it's just, it gives you pause and it makes you think, well, maybe it's worth looking at, do I ovulate regularly? Just that very simple fact uh, or that very simple inquiry into what's going on with your body can give you a lot of information. Yeah, do you see that mirrored in your practice, kind of the amount of people that are not ovulating when they think that they are? How common is it for women to not ovulate? Extremely common. Now, I will say that I am usually working with women who are trying to improve their cycles, so there sure. may be right. some bias there. Um, but uh, but yes, uh, and even myself, when I chart, I chart. I've been charting my cycles for years, and about once a year, I will notice an anovulatory cycle, hmm. and it, I can usually figure out why. It's usually uh, around a stressful time or illness or something's going on. But it happens, and so I wouldn't know otherwise if I were not charting my cycle. Sure. So I would imagine something like that, you know, if there's something stressful going on and you just don't ovulate, is um, it happens. But for mm -hmm. someone who's regularly not ovulating, do you want to get into some of the, um, the reasons why it's so important to be ovulating so that, you know, people kind of have a context for, well, why should I pay attention to this? Right. Great segue. Yeah, um, it is common for, uh, you know, you to have a, a one-off cycle where you don't ovulate, and it's not a catastrophic sort of thing. It happens from time to time. Life is life. Um, but if it's happening pretty frequently, if you're having symptoms of low progesterone, um, so we talked about the fact that you don't really make much progesterone unless you ovulate. And so if you're having some of those symptoms, then it's time to look into what's going on. And so we start, I usually start with clients with charting first because it can give us so much information about uh, the amount of progesterone, the amount of estrogen, and uh, when ovulation happens, if it happens. Um, the benefits of ovulation and progesterone. So I'll step back for a moment and I'll just say that ovulation, regular ovulation, regular ovulatory cycles is a vital sign for women in their fertile years. If we're not regularly ovulating, then that is telling us that our health is somehow compromised or diminished. And so it's just a sign, just like if you were to have high blood pressure or uh, a really, you know, tachycardia, fast heart rate, or bradycardia, a really low, like not sustainable heart rate, uh, if your breathing wasn't healthy, uh, those are other vital signs. But for women, we have that fifth vital sign of ovulation. And so if we look at it from that point, then we want to see, okay, well, what does this, what does ovulation give to my health? And there are studies that will show you that uh, breast health, bone health, brain health, cardiovascular health are all dependent upon a healthy level of progesterone in relationship to estrogen. And so, you know, you can look at bone density studies, you can look at uh, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular studies, and obviously there are links to, um, you know, decreased progesterone and breast cancer rates. And so mm -hmm. remember we talked about estrogen being a growth hormone, yeah. and progesterone is the hormone that kind of keeps it in check. And so if you have all this growth without it being kept in check, um, and the, the specific gift that progesterone gives when it comes to tissue proliferation, the growth, is that it matures the tissue. It doesn't let it grow out of control, but it actually matures it and kind of keeps it in line. It's like you have a whole bunch of teenagers. You just let them go crazy, 
they're going to cause a lot of damage. But if you have some good role models in place to kind of teach them how to be mature and make decisions, it's a whole different scene. Yeah, yeah. That's a great example. That's a big difference. <laughs> big difference. And, um, you know, I want to I want to just remind people, too, this may sound airy-fairy, but we cycle and the moon cycles as well. We ha Women have a very similar cycle to the moon. And so if we are not cycling healthily or if we suppress that cycling with contraception, uh, hormonal contraception, Imagine what it would be like to stop the moon's orbit mm -hmm. and the effect that it would have on the Earth's ecosystem. You know, the moon affects the depth of the ocean and all the creatures that live in and around it. The moon affects the velocity of the Earth's orbit. And so as we, if we shift that or suppress that, imagine what that would happen to the whole ecosystem. And so we have to consider the same sort of thing for our own individual cycles. And so I've probably gone off on a bit of a tangent here. So feel free to bring yeah, me back. Yeah, that's great, that. though. And um, I'll have to type into the comments the um, research um, organization that you mentioned and some of those okay. studies so that people can take a look further into those. Um, because I think it is helpful to see that there are some studies being done and there's some concrete reasons for why it's important to ovulate and what progesterone really does in our body. And it, it can affect your cardiovascular health and it can affect your bone health which so many women are concerned about. And this goes far beyond just making sure that you're taking a calcium supplement, but to really make sure that your body and all the mechanisms inside your body are doing their jobs appropriately. And, you know, it's just like a, a business or an organization. Everyone has certain jobs and they all interact with each other. And if you're missing a whole department, things can go wrong. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if someone listening is wondering whether they ovulate, what are some signs that they could maybe start paying attention to um, in their next cycle to see if this is something going on for them? Yeah, so at the very least, I invite them to start taking their basal body temperature. And they can download a graph off of the, uh, off the Internet. They can make their own on a piece of graph paper. And basically, most women fall between 97 degrees and 99 degrees. So if you want to make a, a graph and have it go from 97 to 99 and have uh, one graph space for every decimal after or every uh, number after the decimal, uh, basically you want to take the, your temperature at the same time each morning within, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes would be ideal. And you want to do it before you get out of bed and have the thermometer right there. And uh, if I always, I always recommend women hold the thermometer in their mouth for nine minutes before they turn it on, because then it will actually equilibrate to your body temperature versus whatever the room temperature is that it's sitting in all night. Mm -hmm. so that actually made a huge difference when you recommend that to me. I can see in my own charts that my temperatures are within a much shorter range than they used to be when I was just putting the thermometer in my mouth and taking the temperature right away. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, you can see that easily when you start taking your temperature. And I know as soon as the weather started turning here recently, we just had kind of like a drop in our temperature. The, you know, I, if I didn't take my temperature for 10 minutes every morning, it would look like my temperature was like 96 point something, you know, yeah. just really, really low. Um, so I ask them to hold it in their mouth for nine minutes. If it's digital, turn it on for a minute. If it's a non-digital, keep it in their mouth for 10 minutes usually takes about a minute for the thermometer to uh, to get to the temperature and, and ding or give you that little signal. And then just at the, you know, whenever you can during the day, just mark that down on your chart. And what you will look for if you're ovulating is you will see uh, a group of lower temperatures. And then after ovulation, that, that temperature will actually increase by at least about a half a degree. And you will literally see it on your graph. And then you will see after ovulation, that temperature will stay up pretty high. And then right before your next period starts, your temperature will drop low. And so just that very thing, if you can commit to that 10 minutes in the morning, and I, I joke with women, you know, like, that's your snooze button. It's nine minutes long. Stick it in your mouth, fall back yeah, to sleep. That's exactly what close. I do. And it's great. <laughs> yeah. And you get an extra nine minutes of sleep. Yeah. Um, and you can also do axillary, you can do vaginal temperature, whatever works most conveniently for the person. And just keep track of that. And you'll be amazed just by that information what your body can communicate to you. 
um, mm -hmm. the amount or the number of days that your temperature stays high between ovulation and the start of your next period, that's going to be the length of your luteal phase. So that is the phase when the uh, egg is out and the corpus luteum, that temporary endocrine gland, is producing progesterone. And so you want to see that those number of days are somewhere around 12 to 15 days long. If it's a lot shorter than that, um, you know, so usually the cutoff is about 10 days for a luteal phase for us to feel like, okay, fertility is not too compromised. I would say ideal, though, is, is 12 days, 12 or more. And um, if your luteal phase is seven or eight or nine days, then that will, that will indicate that your body is having a hard time making progesterone. So we might need to support you in, in making um, more progesterone. Mm -hmm. So before we get into some ways to produce more progesterone, do you, I know earlier you mentioned cervical fluid. Do you want to touch on that here as well? Sure. Yeah, that is, if you are, uh, you know, you're, you started taking your basal body temperature and you're like, I want to understand what's going on. I really want to dig in here and find out more about my fertility. Then I will welcome you to the world of cervical mucus charting, which is. <laughs> it is a world of cervical mucus charting, yeah. It is. It's, it's not hard. There's a little bit of a learning curve just to learn um, what you're looking at and how to characterize it. But when you do, we can gather so much information so here's what happens. We start our period and we bleed for, you know, three to seven days. And then bleeding stops. Generally, we want to see a few days where we don't have any bleeding or any mucus whatsoever. And for some people out there, um, and 10 years ago, this would have been me maybe 12 years ago, I had no idea what cervical mucus was. So I'll explain that to you. <laughs> so yeah. after we have our period and then a few days where we are not bleeding, we have no mucus, we enter our mucus phase. And what the mucus is representing is our increase in estrogen. Because earlier I talked about how estrogen stimulates the cells of the cervix to create mucus. And it creates a, a more uh, higher water content mucus than is normally there. Normally we have a mucus plug in our cervix that keeps out invaders. And it keeps you know, anything out from getting into our uterus. But as we get close to ovulation, we actually want something to come into our uterus Maybe not here, but uh, nature wants something to come to our uterus. Right, yeah. So, <laughs> your your health is going to keep doing this whether you're ready or not, but it's still a good sign to know. <laughs> exactly. So our, our opening into our, our uterus, the cervix, opens up a little bit, and the mucus cells start to create, um, they, they, they go from a mucus plug that's thick to like a high water content, almost egg white, eventually, mucus. And so we'll start to see that each time we go to the bathroom and we wipe. We can look on the toilet tissue, and sometimes we'll see a little creaminess, a little um, shininess. And eventually, as we get closer to ovulation and the estrogen is at its highest, we'll start to see stretchy, and it'll feel slippery. We'll feel wet just being around, um, walking around or sitting. We can kind of get a sensation of wetness. And when you learn how to pay attention to those sensations and to observe what you're wiping at your vulva, that's when you can really make some great insight into your hormone levels. Mm -hmm. And so we want to see that estrogen increase, and we want to see egg white cervical mucus right before you ovulate. And then once ovulation happens, then we want to see that mucus dry up because we don't want a lot of estrogen hanging out. We want a lot of progesterone after ovulation. And progesterone is what keeps the estrogen in check. So we ideally want to see that mucus dry up pretty quickly after we ovulate. If it hangs around, that can be another sign that there's a little bit of unopposed estrogen. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that through the luteal phase. So uh, just paying attention to mucus is uh, another really great way to understand how your cycles are working. So I teach this because to me it is it's a a vital tool that all women should have access to. Some may choose not to use it, but they all should know that it's there and they can get a lot of information about their body by doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it does, you know, there's there are 
several great books out there. The Justice Guidebook, um, which is on, available on Amazon. Most women have heard about taking charge of your fertility, which is kind of like the primer to, to charting, and many women get started there. That was my gateway drug to fertility awareness years yeah. ago. Yeah. As it was and we'll many. link to all of these for anyone um, so you don't have to jot them down. I'll put links to all of these in the comments. Yeah. And so, um, you know, if you have a really easy to understand cycle, everything's super healthy, you can probably get away with any one of those guidebooks to teach you how to chart and to be able to use that information to uh, family planning or just, you know, uh, monitoring your health. If you have any difficulty, if things are not quite right, then I always recommend working with an instructor um, to help make sense of it for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, this is really information that everyone should know at least at one point because your body is producing these fluids no matter what. And mm -hmm. I've heard, you know, many women who thought something was going wrong simply because they hadn't ever been taught that these, this is the cycle of what your hormones are doing in your body that produce these different types of fluids. And it is a normal response. It's a normal thing that you're experiencing. But if you're not aware of that, then some of these fluids can be like, oh, my gosh, what's wrong? Do I need to call my doctor? I don't know what's happening. Exactly. And charting can be incredibly reassuring yeah. because you'll, your body will do very similar things each cycle. If it starts to veer from what you're used to and you're not in perimenopause or you're not postpartum, um, then you can actually be clued into maybe some cervical health issues because your mucus mm -hmm. will actually change if there is some dysplasia or HPV and we can we can see that and be able to be proactive about taking care of it and avoid you know the worst case scenario. Yeah, I think the word proactive is a really great um, concept for this whole thing because you know your body is trying to do these things month after month, and like you said earlier, it's a fifth vital sign. It does indicate something about what's going on in general. And so even if you aren't ready for kids yet, this information can be used just to monitor your own health, just like you would with your blood pressure, just like you would with your other vital signs, just to make sure that everything is functioning properly. Mm -hmm. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how we can improve progesterone? If someone has listened to this, they're going to go kind of start charting their temperatures, which if anyone's nervous, it, it can be a lot of fun. If you really enjoy data, I highly encourage you to give this a try. <laughs> Um, I've been doing it for almost a year now, and, and I really enjoy it. And it becomes a habit, and then it's not a big deal. Yeah, um, it's, it's like it's like getting dressed in the morning. You just yeah. you don't even think about it anymore. But, yeah, but it, it, uh, you're glad that you leave the house with clothes on. So. Exactly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> in hindsight, you're right. Um, so if someone sees, you know, starts paying attention to their, their cervical mucus, and maybe they are suspecting low progesterone, what are some tips that we can give them to kind of boost that production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so typically some of the foundational things that I talk about with clients are nutrition, of course, and gut health. And I know that's something you talk a lot about and work with your clients on. So I usually will refer them to you or to other nutrition therapists um, if they need a lot of help. Uh, but I, it, I can't underestimate or overestimate, sorry, I can't overestimate the importance of good nutrition our ovaries, you know, I talked about how incredible it is that they are able to switch from producing a ton of estrogen to a ton of progesterone within, you know, 24 hours, and then to be able to sustain that to potentially sustain a pregnancy. And if the, a pregnancy does occur, that corpus luteum will continue to produce progesterone for about three months until the, the placenta is developed enough and stable enough to take over that progesterone production, because progesterone is so very important. So it does an amazing job, and because it works so hard metabolically to be able to do that for us, it needs a lot of nutrients. And so if we are not digesting well or if we're not getting the good nutrients into our, into our stomachs, then um, that can affect the quality of our ovarian health and the quality of the corpus luteum, and therefore the amount of progesterone that it can form. Mm -hmm. Other things are stress and we live in a stressful world and this is a hard one for people sometimes they feel like they can't really change their day-to-day -day very much but usually if they start to think about it they can find little areas here and there where they can make improvements to reduce some of their stress 
they can they can figure out how to say no to certain things or they could uh, delegate things and it's really vital to be able to start that process because women especially myself included we are so uh, we, we get so into doing things for others and making sure we're committing to and we're doing this and we're doing that and following through on this that we can overcommit tremendously and we can we take on so much of other people's worries things that are not ours to worry about it's, it's a very natural state we're empathetic creatures and we are creatures of connection and so it is a um, a vital skill for us to learn how to prioritize our own health and well-being and um, that is some of the heart like usually women will you know improve their diet tremendously. They'll take the supplements they're supposed to and they'll do it on time every day, but yet they won't um, take care of themselves and say no to things or, um, you know, really, really look into that. So I invite women to to really think about that and be honest with themselves and ask a good friend or someone to sit down and give them ideas. You know, how can I reduce this? How can I take this load off? I think that's very, very important. And when women figure out how to do that, they usually start to see some of some big benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so those basic foundational things, they don't cost money. They just, you know, maybe they would if you hire a house cleaner, um, but it's worth it. <laughs> if you can do it, you know, it's worth it. Um, but generally, there are things that are, are tangible that you can do. And then uh, there are many nutrients specific specifically that the ovary needs. We, we need zinc, we need B vitamins, we need magnesium, vitamin D, CoQ10, um, iodine, selenium. And so again, diet comes into that. And if you are not getting enough in your own natural diet, you may need to supplement with them. And so those are some things that can help boost your production. And remember that ovarian uh, follicles, where the eggs grow, they take about three full months or about 100 days to develop to maturity. And so these changes are not going to be seen in two weeks. Uh, they may take a full 100 days before you see the full effects. Generally, though, women will start to notice some changes. Mm -hmm. And so for my clients, you know, they might notice when we support um, something called estrogen metabolism, meaning helping their body to break down and excrete the excess estrogen that's in their system. We do that with supporting their liver, a couple of supplements. Um, what they'll start to notice is that the luteal phase, where they used to have a lot of mucus hanging around, it will start to diminish and they'll have a lot less mucus. And um, they might only notice it once a day versus three or four times a day. Or, you know, they're having it every other day. Now they're having it once or twice a week. And so it'll start to make an impact, um, and it, it can be gradual. I've also had some women, you know, the younger they are, <laughs> the more uh, biological reserve they have. And so for some women, within a cycle, they just take off, and things yeah. look so much better. And it's, it's amazing, you know, and they, they make the commitment, and they do the work, and it shows up. And that's really gratifying if you're charting your cycles. And so... I generally only work with women who are willing to chart their cycles because it is such a valuable diagnostic tool. It's one of the few ways where we can really uh, be able to see the impact of the suggestions that we're making. Otherwise, I can make suggestions till we're blue in the face and, you know, we don't know if they're really helping. You know, we can tell by some symptoms, but we can often see from the chart before we even see with the symptoms. And I don't want you spending a ton of money on a supplement that isn't doing anything. So mm -hmm. we can see the reflection of the improvement there in the charts, then that is a, that's really valuable for me as a practitioner. But I think that my clients really love to get to see. It's, it's like feedback from their body. It's not me just telling them, no, this is good. The research says that this is going to help you. It's their body saying, this is good. This is helping me. Let's keep it up. <laughs> yes, it's working. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and you get this skill for life that you can continue to use, and you're not paying for hormone testing every month. Because the mm -hmm. only other way, if you aren't charting your cycles or paying attention to symptoms, is to do 
the tests. And, you know, there are more tests available nowadays. Your doctor can do some. You can order things like that. But that's a pretty big expense. And to do that really more than once or twice a year could be pretty extreme. But with charting, you're able to see what's going on. It sounds like even within a couple of days, you can see what's going on right now. You don't have to wait for results. You don't have to wait to test again. You can get that immediate feedback. Right. You know, there's a time, a times when uh, a test may be helpful, but in general, we still need to do all the foundational work and mm -hmm. the charting, because without that, we, we're going to be lost in the weeds. And so um, it's just a much more efficient way of approaching any subfertility or menstrual cycle problems, and I, 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 it's good medicine to utilize charts. And I, I don't even understand how... Uh, physicians or any practitioner who works with women to improve their menstrual cycles. I don't even know how they do it without charting. So <laughs> that that to me is just like, I don't know, doing everything blindfolded with your hands behind your back. It just makes it so much harder. Yeah, and that just goes to show how much information you can get from your charts. These simple yeah. things like taking your temperature and observing your cervical mucus are a direct yeah. barrier of what's happening with your hormones, which is really incredible. Yeah, and I think that most of my clients are, even if they've been charting according to taking charge of your fertility and have some um, experience with that, already some in insight, I think even they are surprised when I teach them the Justice method, which is which is different, mm -hmm. a little more uh, specific about mucus observations. Uh, and they are surprised at just how much more information they can get from a few minutes a day of keeping track of their biomarkers of fertility. Absolutely. Well, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Do you have maybe like one kind of takeaway that you really want to make sure people get from this conversation? Yeah. Oh, what I, I guess I want to stress is that when, you know, there's a time and a place for all options, and I, I want women to know all of their options. And we have been told so many times, I hear doctor-level professionals tell women all the time that the pill will regulate their cycles. And constantly, even in our menstrual cycle health group, people post, you know, I've had irregular cycles and I'm trying to get pregnant. The doctor put me on this pill for 30 days and um, to regulate it. And so we, I feel like there's a lot of education that needs to take place. The pill does not ever regulate a cycle. Mm -hmm. It will give you a regular withdrawal bleed and so what happens there is we, we're on a drug throughout the month and the last seven days we're off of that drug and so we get a withdrawal bleed and so it will look like we have a period every 28 days but we're not ovulating and it's not a, a the bleed is not a true period and so if not if women get nothing else out of this I want them to know that and that it is so important for their overall health to ovulate not only while we're in our fertile years but because the balance between estrogen and progesterone that we have through our cycling years actually protects us postmenopausally through the end of our life, all those years, against heart disease, breast cancer, all kinds of cancers, um, bone health, which, you know, it, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for uh, strong bone health throughout mm -hmm. our older years. There's, yeah. So I, could, I could go on. But, yeah, ovulation is so important now and for the rest of our lives. And contraception, hormonal contraception, is synthetic, and it keeps us from ovulating. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't fix the underlying problem if there is an issue with your hormones. So no. if someone is um, on birth control and they're hearing all of this, what other options are available to them if they're not ready to have kids yet? Yeah. So clearly most people know about condoms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have a, an efficacy rate in the 87 percentile around there. Um, and for some, that, that that's okay. Uh, some people like to utilize uh, something a little more effective. <laughs> and, um, and, and so fertility awareness method and the way that I teach it is uh, has a, an efficacy rate of about 99.5% if you follow the rules. And that means it requires abstinence during your fertile phase. So for those seven to ten days of the cycle where you are fertile and could potentially become pregnant, if you are to abstain, then you will enjoy that 99.5% effectiveness rate. 
um, the pill is at about 97% effective, I believe, give or take, um, if you take it at the same time every morning. But uh, average user method uh, efficacy is about 91% because not everyone takes the pill at the same time every day. Um, uh, there are other methods out there, and so it can vary on, on how uh, good of a user you are. Uh, <laughs> but the I think that's true in a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The fertility awareness method will at least tell you what days, so that, that that's the gift of fertility awareness method. Every day you will know, am I fertile or am I not? Could unprotected intercourse end in a pregnancy? And you will know that every day. And so there's a lot of reassurance in that. And then you can make your choice. If you are willing to take the risk of using a condom, then you default to the condom's rate of efficacy on your fertile days. Um, if you want to be even more careful, you can use a condom and withdrawal and make that really effective. And so I will let people know that when you learn fertility awareness method, so when you learn fertility awareness method, you will know without a doubt each day whether or not you could get pregnant. That information alone can be very powerful and it can help you make more informed choices about your behaviors, what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, if you can accept a certain amount of risk or not, this is about giving you the power in your hands to make the choices that are best for you. And that method does not have any ill health effects. You still benefit from ovulating every cycle, which mm -hmm. is priceless, as we've talked about. And so it's the only method that I know that can provide a high efficacy rate without compromising your health, both in the short term and the long term. So um, many couples, yeah, you know, many couples combine fertility awareness method with condom use and or withdrawal, um, and that's up to the individual. As practitioners, you know, we counsel people on, you know, what, what their risk level is, let them know mm -hmm. the facts, and they can make the choices. So there is a lot more out there than what you've been told. There are other options that are just as effective, if not more effective, than the pill, but don't have the devastating health consequences. And we didn't even talk about the side effects. No, yeah, we didn't. That was on our list, but we um, had so much other things to cover. We'll have to do another one just about the pill, because that is easily another hour's worth of information. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I will link in the comments to all the things that we um, referenced today, to the research institute that is looking at progesterone that you mentioned um, some of the books that you mentioned, of course, we will link to your information if anyone is interested in learning how to chart their cycles. So there is a ton of information that you can get from it. We'll link over to you. Um, and for anyone who's watching, so this was the first in a series of interviews all about modern day women's health and trying to be healthy amidst the chaos of our realities um, in what is often a... Um, culture that does not make it easy to just be healthy without some effort, um, which is unfortunate. So we're going to be talking all about different um, topics within that. And tomorrow I'm going to be interviewing um, Priscilla Johnson. She's a nutritional therapy practitioner about skin health, finally getting clear skin by making some really simple dietary and nutrition changes. So I invite anyone to watch that um, tomorrow and to kind of watch the whole sequence because we're going to be talking about all different kinds of topics. Cool. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we will talk to you soon.